Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, and together with my co-host, Mark Kornich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechphilly.com, and as you can see here, weekly columnist for the Jewish press. Great, and I'm having a lot of fun doing all of that, and uh, what I write about in my column called Albany Beat is about how government relates to the Jewish community or doesn't, as the case may be. <coughs> But uh, with us today is a really special guest. I, I met him recently and just had, was just floored by all the things that he does. He, you're, uh, it's David Hochfelder. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to the Jewish View. Thank you. It's great you're to be here. a professor of history mm -hmm. at uh, University of Albany. Mm -hmm. You also have this group, Solarize Albany. So we're mm -hmm. going to talk about solar energy. You can see it right on his shirt over and here, then, yeah. Mark. You and don't have to tell and us. And then you also yeah. are involved with this group, 98 Acres in Albany. Mm -hmm. where they took 98 acres to make the Empire State Plaza mm -hmm. and they leveled all these homes. Right. So that's the history part, I yes. guess, in you. Get back uh, to the science uh, over the Because cell solar energy. is the future and has been the future mm -hmm. for it's 40 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. If you get my drift, it's not necessarily... Uh, it could be history also because you're There's learning about mm -hmm. the history. Well, what's your of solar position energy? about solar rise? You see, as your shirt says, Solar Rise to Albany. Mm -hmm. You have a mission, a purpose of mm -hmm. your organization? Sure. Um, solar Rise Albany, or Solar Rise rather, was a U.S. Department of Energy program that arose in 2009 out of the National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory. And the idea was to get citizen volunteer groups together around the country to help drive down the cost of solar and encourage people to install solar on their on their rooftops. And the first Solarize project occurred in 2009 in Portland, Oregon and was very successful. And then Solarize projects started here in New York State in 2012 and 2013 and uh, in, in Tompkins County and Monroe County. And we've been active here in Albany for about two years now. This is our second campaign. Uh, there's, there was a Solarize Troy campaign last year, and there's a Solarize Saratoga and a Solarize Schenectady County as so well. Your point is just to get people aware mm -hmm. so they should just get Solarize for their homes. Yes. It's an education program. And, and, yes. and you just want solar energy on mm -hmm. pe in people's homes, not necessarily one company or another. You're just trying to promote solar energy. We're trying to promote solar energy. We're trying to educate uh, people in Albany County about the benefits of solar. But we do work with a particular company, and uh, to give you a sense of the process, um, in the winter for both the 2015 and 2016 campaigns, we sent out a request for proposal to every solar vendor that's on NYSERDA's list, and it's around 200 companies. New, New York State Energy. New York State Energy Research, Research and, Development. and Development Authority. Correct, correct. Um, as, as an aside, there are about 25 solarized projects around the state recognized by NYSERDA and, and funded by NYSERDA, we received a $5,000 grant to help with our publicity efforts. So um, the idea is to evaluate proposals from as many solar vendors as want to submit them. And we received eight proposals this year, and we carefully went through them. And again, we're a group of volunteer citizens. We don't make any money from this. Personally, we're doing this because we want to help um, the help energy the transition. World. Help yeah. the world. Yeah. I mean, it's tikkun you know, olam. Yeah, you know, Mark, you <laughs> say that. I just wanted to, I'm from the Lubavitcher Chabad Chassidim, mm -hmm. and the Lubavitcher Rebbe who passed away in 1994, but so mm -hmm. you're talking about many years ago, you're talking about in 2009, 2012, and it's mm -hmm. getting more popular. You're right in the last 10 years, but just when it was an initial state, the Rebbe, who anyway is not only a rabbi, head rabbi, mm -hmm. but he has an engineering degree from the Sorbonne, and he just said at a public uh, address that he said solar energy was the way to go. I mean, there was a lot of problems, again, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago. Remember the oil embargo, right. or there wasn't enough oil. I mean, maybe they have enough now in natural gas, but he just said solar energy is the way to go. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, it took a long time for people to, you know, pick up. And maybe it's the science that tell us about the science also, mm -hmm. how economical it is for a home to go solarized. I mean, maybe it's good for the environment. You're not using up oil or natural mm -hmm. gas. Or nuclear energy, whatever. Right. But on the other hand, um, you know, dollars and cents. When you talk to a homeowner, mm -hmm. hey, how much is it saving? Th those are those are excellent questions. Um, if you look at what's been going on in the solar industry, so in 1994, um, when Rabbi Schneerson is it? Yeah, good. Um, wanted to adopt solar. The cost was several times greater than what it is today. 
So what's, what's been happening is as the industry scales up, the cost drops. So one of the barriers um, for wider adoption of solar is cost, uh, and, and, or another way to look at it is how long it'll take you to recoup your investment. And today, the payback is around seven or eight years. Um, there are state and federal tax credits that are available that defray 55% of the cost if you have, if you pay enough state and federal taxes, that is. Um, there are also other options for leasing an installation or for uh, what's called a power purchase agreement where you're buying the electricity from the array on your rooftop, but the solar installer owns the array and will charge you for the electricity, usually around 20% less than your national grid bill. Um, so as the industry has scaled up and, and, and programs like Solarize around the country have helped drive that, the cost has dropped from, for example, about 10 years ago, the cost was around $8 a watt for solar. Now it's around $3. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's a huge bending yeah, sure. of the cost curve. And as you see the cost curve going down, you see more people adopting solar. Um, even if you walk around you know, any Albany neighborhood, you will see solar installations on people's mm -hmm. roofs. There are a variety of options. You know, the Solarize program is one option. We have a chosen installer, um, Apex, who's located in Queensbury. But we also encourage people who may be skeptical to get several quotes. It's a, it's a rather demanding process. It's around the same cost as buying a new car, but everyone sort of knows how to buy a car. You know, you go to a dealership, you've done your research, you know what a fair price is for the car, you know what options you want. But with solar, it's, it's a little more complicated because you're basically buying your own power plant. So there are technical questions, um, there are questions about the warranty, um, you know, how, how long the warranty for the panels and the inverters are good for, um, that sort of thing. And, and usually a solar installation will operate 25 to 30 years without any trouble. There are no moving parts. Um, there's some uh, efficiency decline. So at the end of 25 or 30 years, your installation might be generating 85% of what it was generating when you first installed it. But again, there are no moving parts. There's nothing really to go wrong. So these systems, there, there are solar systems installed by NASA that have been working for 50 years. But it wouldn't make a difference what kind of home you have? Yes. I mean, because let's say somebody has a 75-year-old house, mm -hmm. or sometimes people have 10, 15-year-old house. Right. Would it make a difference to the solar energy? Very much so. Uh, very few solar installers, for example, will install on top of slate roofs. Really? Yeah, because of the nature of the roof. Um, to take my, my personal, our family's personal example, we have a row house and we have a strange roof. It's basically four different small rooms. So we don't have a site that is eligible for solar ourselves. And that's one of the reasons why this year we're partnering with a group called Helderberg Community Energy, which again, they don't want to make any money off this. They're doing this to help drive the energy transition to a zero carbon economy. Um, and they're going to build a two megawatt solar array they're on the verge of signing a contract with a company called Monolith to build the array. And they'll have around 150 openings for uh, households who can't install solar. And they have the same sort of financing options ranging from a lease to a power purchase agreement to you can buy a share in the array like it's a co-op. And we'll probably buy a share. Um, and we're also looking at getting a plug-in hybrid car and we'll be using solar for that. And just to follow that point up, we really can't make the transition to a zero carbon energy economy without electrifying transportation. So we can install solar for home electricity use and that's great and we certainly encourage people to do that. But until we have a lot of electric vehicles on the road, we're still going to be consuming fossil fuels. Now, you know, I hear this uh, word, this phrase solar farm. Mm -hmm. And I noticed when I went to Suffolk County and Hot Pod that the mm -hmm. county government has this huge area where they have solar panels mm -hmm. and then people park underneath mm -hmm. these solar panels so it's like a carport mm -hmm. so is that something that we could emulate here in albany and should we and is there property for it anywhere is there a way that you know when you're in a more um, a shaded area mm -hmm. that maybe these solar farms could have electricity getting to your mm -hmm. house so that you could reduce your cost? Yes, and that's exactly what Helderberg Community Energy will be offering and that, that um, we'll be buying into. Um, municipalities and counties, um, thanks to some uh, rule changes from the Public Service Commission and from uh, backed by NYSERDA, municipalities and, and governmental entities can install solar 
their own solar arrays for the purposes, let's, let's say the town of Bethlehem um, has uh, several of their so-called meters, you know, a school or a maintenance building or what have you that are powered from Bethlehem's solar array. Um, that's a fairly recent innovation in the past two or three years. It used to be that you could only power one meter from one array, and now you can have several meters running off, off one array. So a lot of townships and, and municipalities have, have begun moving in that direction. Uh, you have uh, frequently asked questions on your website, mm -hmm. so I'm going to test you to see if oh. you know yeah. the answers to these. <laughs> and by the way, the website is www.solarizealbany.org. Okay. Thank I you. didn't know if it was org or net or whatever, but it's org. Okay. It's org, yes. Um, how do I know if my home is suitable for solar? Um, the process is that the installer will send a team out to the house. First of all, they'll look at your house from Google Earth because that'll spot some very obvious things like tree shading or direction of the roof that direction of the What's roof the is What's the better facing. direction? South. South? South. That's yeah. where the Miami Beach, that's where the, <laughs> that's where the sun's coming from. Well, sun and fun. the closer you are to the equator, the more you can put solar facing any direction, but we're not too close to the equator here. Um, <laughs> far by far, yeah. Right. So once uh, an installer looks at Google Earth or a similar mapping platform and says, you know, yeah, that might be a likely site. They'll send a team out to measure how much sunlight falls on the site. And they'll also look at things like your roof size. They'll also look at your electricity bill for the last 13 months and to see how much electricity you use versus how much solar you can install. What sort of maintenance is required? Very little. Um, any solar installer will recommend that you have a fairly new roof, five years old or less usually. And if you have a new roof in good condition, once the array is, is, is built on top of your house, again, there are no moving parts, so there's nothing really to go wrong. And what is solar PV system? It um, stands for photovoltaic. It's the conversion of sunlight into electric current. Okay. So just Can so I, people don't think photovoltaic begins with an F, it begins with a P. Correct, a PH. Let me yes. ask you a question. <laughs> once I saw it, it could be sometimes, you know, it's just like, the uh, man by, bites dog, according to Mark Ronich, is our news reporter. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like it could be one out of a million, or they say that one house was on fire because of the solar panels. Mm -hmm. So again, it could be one out of the million, or is it a real danger? Um, it a I mean, problem? problem. It can happen, yeah. Um, fire departments around the country um, are asking homeowners to put disconnects in, in an area where the firefighters know where they are and there's a, a unified solar permitting process that the state of New York has that many that encouraging municipalities to adopt this unified permit process that specifies where the disconnect should be and that the fire department can clearly identify and, and disconnect the, now, the solar system. You have a question on here that I'm only, <laughs> I'm only reading because mm -hmm. um, it's just a funny uh, way of uh, phrasing this uh, whole topic. Will I still receive a monthly electric bill after installing a solar system? Yes. Now I think of a solar system mm -hmm. as the nine planets. <laughs> Only eight. So Pluto's been kicked out. <laughs> okay. So of all our planets is a solar system. Right. But that's not what you're referring to. No, of course when not. When you say that. So. Of course not. <laughs> um, well, you know, there are people out there who, uh, <laughs> you know, think that there's going to be some sort of vein with like all these uh, right. planets going around on their roof. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't speak for National Grid's business on Alpha Centauri. I can only speak to it um, here in our solar system. Um, yes, you will continue to receive a, a bill from, from your utility unless you totally disconnect from the grid and have battery backup. That's a much more expensive option. Mm -hmm. Basically, we recommend that people continue to stay connected to the grid. So you'll have to pay a monthly service fee just to remain connected to the grid. And there may be times during the winter, for example, where your solar array on top of your house is not producing enough to satisfy your yes, electricity. I was going to ask, what if it's like a gray, you know, like you say in the winter and the fall, you just have a gray week. Or there's snow know? on your panels. Really? Right. That's, then nothing's going to happen? Anymore. You're going to get some electricity generated, but basically this is why National Grid, or Solar Installer rather, wants to see 13 months of your National Grid bills, which give your electricity consumption throughout the year. Um, in the summer, you'll be producing, over the course of the entire calendar year, it works out to less than 110% of it. You're capped at 110% of your consumption that you can generate with your installation. So let's say you have 100%. During the summer months, like now or August, you might be producing 120% of your 
electricity consumption. And during the summer, that's really when you want that kind of um, electricity being produced. You know, it's hot out, people are running their air conditioners. This is when utilities wind up hitting their peak power right. issues. So this would lessen that. So this would lessen that. Yeah, it's a great, solar is a great peaking power system. And in the winter, you might be producing 80% of your consumption, but it averages out to 100%. Now, some people lease these systems. Mm -hmm. And what happens if they move mid-lease? Um, that's a good question. The lease can transfer to the new homeowner. Um, I personally, our, our family is not looking at a lease option, so I, I confess I haven't researched that as well as I ought to have. Um, but if you certainly talk to a solar installer and in leasing, let's say you don't want to pay for the installation and you, do, you prefer to lease, um, that's a question you could work out with your, your solar installer. And can you take the system to the new home? Um, probably not. I don't think you could disassemble it and move it. If you I mean, choose to lease a solar system, you will not own the system and therefore will not be able to take it with you. Right. Check with your installer right. if they are offering a separate leasing option. Always good advice. Check okay. with your installer. Um, now, oh, what if the new home purchaser doesn't want the system? I believe that the um, installer will have to remove it. Okay. But again, that leasing is not an option that we are looking at, so I personally haven't research, okay. researched it. Now, I just want the audience to know that you have a beautiful flow chart <laughs> on your website. That is a nice website. flow chart. So if they go to the website, solarizedalbany.org, mm -hmm. then they can look at the flow chart and they can see it. We really can't show it on TV right, right sure. now. But. but you know, one of the things, Dad, like for example, my house, obviously I have electricity, obviously, <laughs> but really? in all of you see, <laughs> I would hope so. In a cave over here, right. <laughs> In any case, they also have natural gas. I mean, the, the heating, the hot water. Sure. And, um, you know, would it take care of both? I mean, solar, I mean, I don't, just what I'm saying, I have zero mm -hmm. understanding of how it works. Would I cut down electricity and natural gas? Could it, can I put in, like, let's say, oh, I have electricity flowing in my house. Mm -hmm. Let me put in some electric heaters better than this you know, the natural gas heating system. You can certainly, if you're using gas for heating hot water, you can certainly convert to an electric hot water heater. Um, you could convert, say, your, your gas stove to an electric range. I mean, there are things you could do to convert to electricity. There's also the option of solar hot water or solar thermal, and mm -hmm. you see these on a lot of houses these days. And I sort of is really starting to get into that space a little more, a little more seriously. So you can install a system that will heat hot water on your rooftop and you might need to supplement natural gas for it again on days when it's, it's cold and not very sunny. But there are solar thermal options as well that, that can substitute for natural gas. It's interesting over here. So really, and just, so I mean, is it rising? What's the, I mean, if, again, Mark says we can't show a graph on the TV, but I mean, what percentage is, like you say, it's been, if we can use a, it's a hot commodity, mm -hmm. solarize over here, use a pun. But I mean, how many, percentage of people are using it or just numbers you know how yeah. is it caught on um, that's a good question I don't have a hard figure um, but if you look at both the cost curve and the adoption curve it they're they're rising solar installations are rising exponentially um, if you look year to year the number of people installing solar and businesses the installed capacity if you want to put it that way has been rising exponentially for the past decade the, we, I think we should move on All to right. the other. You're an interesting person. You have so many. Yeah. I like to talk about your history also. I Thank love you. history, but so all right. things to talk about. Yeah. We could spend hours on just uh, mm -hmm. solar energy and the solar system. I'd be yeah. happy to. I'd be happy to. <laughs> but that's, uh, you also have this uh, group that you put together. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a book or whatever, but it's 98 acres mm -hmm. of, uh, that were taken from, for the Empire State Plaza. Uh, mainly an Italian community mm -hmm. was devastated. I know that it was somewhat of a Jewish community also. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, when I came in here, it was after they knocked everything down, but I saw people in the community saying, oh, he so, had a store yeah. there and a lot mm -hmm. of Jewish people. So tell us what you know, what you know about it and what sure. you want other people to know about it. Um, the project is called 98 Acres in Albany, and the best way to get acquainted with what we're doing is to go to 98acresinalbany.wordpress.com. Okay. And we have a blog there where we're telling some of the stories from the lives of people who's, um, who were displaced from because of the, the Empire State Plaza. 
Um, you asked about the demographics, and there were 7,000 people, slightly less than 7,000 people living there in 1962 when the state seized the area via eminent domain. Um, that was under Rockefeller. Yeah, under Governor Rockefeller, his Rockefeller first term. Rockefeller wanted to knock down. Correct. Make a real world-class capital. Right. Um, as far as the demographics of the area, the area around Madison and, and Grand was certainly the heart of the Italian community, and a lot of that is still there. You know, about half of that, the structures from so-called Little Italy are still there. The largest ethnic group in the entire 98-acre take area was actually African American at oh. about 15 percent, and growing the population. African American population had doubled during the 1950s, and because of housing discrimination, African Americans could not move to apartments or homes above Larkin, Delaware. So, yeah, the 98 good. acres was one of the um, one of the, uh, uh -huh. the, the central parts of the African American community. Now, I don't know if you know the story of how what uh, precipitated mm -hmm. this, but let me just tell you, and even if you do know, sure. I, I'm under the impression that the uh, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands came to visit uh, Governor Rockefeller at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And it, then he had this state dinner for him, for her rather, for Queen Beatrix at the mansion. And in order to get from the state Capitol to the executive mansion, you had to go through this, uh, this, these 98 acres. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was really kind of embarrassed by what that <coughs> whole neighborhood looked like. And he promised her that the next time she comes to Albany, there will be this huge um, uh, de uh, development and, bu yeah. and ur you know, urban renewal, mm -hmm. that they'll build a government complex. And that's what really sparked his interest in wanting to get this done. And when I went online to see your, the website that mm -hmm. you mentioned, I noticed that there was this arch, this freedom arch, mm -hmm. that was supposed to be at the uh, Empire State Plaza, and that wasn't, I don't know why it wasn't there, no one seems to know why, but everyone's speculating, but the other thing is, I got to tell you, the first interview that I ever did was March of 1978, mm -hmm. when they cut the ribbon at mm -hmm. the opening mm -hmm. of the Empire State Plaza, Right. and that was, and I interviewed Governor Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. And he was the first interview, and that's why I stayed in journalism, because <laughs> once you get to see that guy, and you hear him, and that big raspy voice that he has, and he focused in on you, I mean, there were tens of thousands of people uh, mm -hmm. around, and he just, I, I was in college, I said, I'd like to interview you, and he was like, yes, son, you know, you could do, yes, yeah, sure. And he stood there for what seemed like a half hour, an eternity, and <laughs> it was maybe four or five minutes. But he really took the time and didn't care about anything else and took the Did time to answer my questions. Did you ask him why he knocked down 98 acres? I didn't know the whole story. Yeah, I was right. about 17 years old. Right. I mean, I really didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden, uh, I had this wonderful interview with this. Are you into this government. because you're a historian? What yes. kind of history do you teach in uh, SUNY? Well, um, uh, to answer some of Mark's questions a little bit um, first, for, I do yeah. U.S. history first of all. all right. Did I get um, the Queen Beatrix story correct? That was one of the precipitating factors, okay. but it's also clear. So, in in the 1950s, the state was building the Uptown Harriman Office Campus and planned to have about 20,000 state workers there. And if you've ever been on the Harriman campus, you know that it's designed around the automobile. So, like cities around the country after World what War II, it was designed around the automobile. I don't know. Um, you say that? It, connection to the highway system. I mean, it's just like, yeah, so you can go around. Yeah. It's easy access. It's, it's, it was designed to facilitate um, state office workers traveling from their suburban homes right, to good. their offices. You know, whereas right, it's, it's not very pedestrian friendly or, you know, bus friendly, mass transit friendly. Mm -hmm. So it was really designed with the automobile in mind. And um, the Corning administration really did not want state office jobs moving uptown presumably out of the city or, you know, with state workers moving out of the city. So well, it's, um, still city. it's still in the city, but again, it's, it's designed to facilitate. It's, out, it's a, a right. flight out of downtown. Right, exactly. Um, whether to the outlying neighborhoods or to the, to the suburbs. Right. Um, so Corning kept pressuring the state to continue to rent office space, commercial office space in downtown Albany. The state was renting about half of the available commercial office space in downtown. And um, 
you know, we don't know what would have happened had the Empire State Plaza not been built, but I think it's a safe bet that state jobs would have moved to the uptown campus and that people would have moved out of downtown Albany. So in some ways, like it or not, the Empire State Plaza um, preserved state jobs being downtown. It's interesting. I never thought of that. So people just to write downtown instead of mm -hmm. moving out. So, yeah. so are you it could have been built on other sites, you know, down by the river or Sheridan Hollow were other options considered. Um, but it was pretty clear that if you wanted to preserve um, the vitality of, of the central business district and some of the inner core neighborhoods, that state jobs had to, one way or the other, remain downtown. That's right. So, so what's the point of 98 acres? I mean, right. I mean it, uh, PBS did a story about it, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, you know, what would be your point? Our goal is to build a website that will digitally reconstruct and repopulate the area. We found photographs taken for appraisal purposes. Why is that necessary to do? I think in order to really understand the impact of urban renewal on Albany and also other cities, um, it's important to document what those areas looked like and who lived there. So using state records, we can also repopulate the area. We can put people back in their homes and apartments and places of business. And I think to get a full accounting of the costs and benefits of urban renewal, well, we need I, to have when, that When I moved here, history. I was, oh, I, it was, I guess, kind of fresh. You know, this mm -hmm. new plaza was still kind of fresh, and people sure. were very bitter about the, uh, about this Empire State Plaza mm -hmm. and what they did. And I just think that if you keep this story going, people are going to continue to be bitter and, mm -hmm. and drum up bad feelings. You could say that about any major historical event, I would, I would think. Um, but it's important, again... I mean, it, we're not talking Nazi Germany here. I mean, you know, that's no, an important reason for a different, a, a different mm -hmm. time. Sure. But I'm just saying, you know, why just drum up, you know, continue the bad feelings towards the state government that this brings? We're not attempting to do that. We're attempting to be objective, even scientific about it. Um, we think it's important that again, to, to understand the full impact of urban renewal, on, not just on Albany, but on cities around the country, um, that reconstructing and repopulating these lost streetscapes can help us assess what you know, urban renewal meant for the country's history. It's very interesting because it goes, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. even from the 1950s, everybody was rolling out of this uh, city into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, you don't see it so much in the Capital District, but New York City, <coughs> Chicago, I know, mm -hmm. are just boom, you know, where they were always uh, slums, you know, and you say a million dollars, a million dollars, you can't even buy a garage, and in Harlem and Bedford Stein. Mm -hmm. So it really has an impact at Albany that much, or maybe you know better than I do. But, you um, know, I'm just saying people are coming back to the city. <coughs> mm -hmm. Now it's become a new trend. Yeah, and there's certainly been a process of gentrification. You know, the, the house that I grew up in in Chicago, I could not afford today. Um, How about you, Rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gone back. We have to go back. We'll have to go see the Cubs over here. That's right. right. Yeah. Now's yeah. the year. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and you use the word slum, and I think that we don't. We purposely avoid terms like that because people make their homes where they make their homes, and whether or not someone like a census taker or Governor Rockefeller says, "Oh, this building is dilapidated or it's a slum." People make their lives in neighborhoods where they do, and I don't think people would describe their their places of residence as slums. Home, I, I right. have to tell you, and right. I brought this up at a neighborhood association meeting. This mm -hmm. city is not going to move forward if they continue on wanting to live in the past and relive the past. I know you're a <coughs> history professor. I know mm -hmm. how much history means to you, mm -hmm. but still, and it means a lot to me. I love history, but. You know, we, this city was built for a different time. You have streets. You have streets here that you can that they allow you to park on both sides of the street, and it's a two-way street, and mm -hmm. it's not big enough for four four lanes, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you know, I and the homes are so small, you have to leave some of them to change your mind. I mean, you, they're just not built for this type of an era that we're living in. And if we don't knock down these homes and we don't build new, we're really not going to get anywhere. And people are going to come to the city, look at it, and say, mm -hmm. oh, this is an old city, and, and just hightail out of here. Yeah, I understand that. I think I'll, I'll, I need to respectfully disagree because one of the, the um, key elements that, that Albany has is its 19th century streetscape. I mean, that's what makes Albany an exciting city, I would argue. And I think it's important to, to preserve our heritage 
as much as we can, and certainly the historic preservation. I would love to. I would love to say, uh, uh, in a Dutch site, a Dutch settlement recreation down by the water, mm -hmm. and like they have uh, Williams, uh, Williamsburg in, mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia, Virginia, and they have in uh, the restorations out in uh, Massachusetts mm -hmm. and Long Island, and they recreate these villages and stuff. I'd love to see that. But that doesn't mean that's the place to go visit to learn. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want to live in that. And, and a lot of these places, yeah, they, they they have some <coughs> charm to some people. But that doesn't mean it has to be throughout the city. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the upper wards or the lower wards have to continue to live in an area that doesn't fit in today's society. And that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um I guess I would encourage you to talk to somebody from the historic preservation community. I have. We've, she's been on the show. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. We have everybody on the show, but I think we're out of time, Mark. Professor, you're really intriguing. I still would like to talk to you about U.S. history, but maybe sure. for another show because I love history. Mm -hmm. But you're doing such in volunteer work besides your profession and solar energy. And like I say, the Rebbe did encourage that. So I encourage mm -hmm. that as being a representative of the Rebbe. Maybe I should have it on my home too, and you know, and get mm -hmm. on with it. And um, and also the good work you're doing. History is important. You don't if you don't know your history, then you don't know where you're going to. I say that about Judaism a lot, but I think that no, goes for any any true. society. So thank you very okay. much for okay. being on the Jewish yes. View. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. Continued success.